Hello everyone, welcome back to another video here on my channel, Metacosis Omar. Today we are going to be talking about the LAC operon, a classic example of gene regulation in bacteria. We'll break down how the LAC operon works, why it's important, and how it helps bacteria like E. coli adapt to changes in their environment. Whether you're studying for the MCAT or just curious about gene expression, this video has you covered. Alright, so starting off, let's talk about what the LAC operon is. The LAC operon is a segment of a single chromosomal, circular chromosomal DNA of the E. coli bacteria. The whole point of the LAC operon is to transcribe and then translate to proteins necessary to bring in and break down lactose for energy. This is what the LAC operon looks like. We have the five prime upstream and three prime downstream regions. Starting from the upstream, we have LAC I, which codes for our repressor. This repressor binds to the operator region on the LAC operon. Then we move on to the structural genes, the components that we're actually trying to transcribe, which are LAC Z, LAC Y, and LAC A. Starting off, LAC Z codes for beta galactosidase which breaks down, as we see here in this reaction, lactose into glucose and galactose via an allolactose intermediate. LACY, going up here, codes for permease, a membrane protein that facilitates lactose uptake from the environment into the bacterial cell. LAC-A codes for transacetylase, which transfers an acetyl group from acetyl-CoA to specific sugars, detoxifying non-lactose or non-metabolizable lactose analogs. While transacetylase isn't as crucial as beta-galactosidase and permease, it prevents the buildup of toxic lactose analogs in E. coli cell. An important concept here is actually basal level transcription. Even though the repressor encoded by LAC-I that we see here binds to the operator, there's always a low level of basal transcription going on. This ensures that a small amount of permease that we could see here allows lactose to enter when it becomes available. Basal transcription is crucial because it gives the cell the initial tools needed to start breaking down lactose. So we have just a basal level or low level of beta-galactosidase and permease always available so lactose is even able to enter the cell. Once lactose enters the cell, as we see here via the permease, lactose is then broken down by beta-galactosidase into that allo-lactose intermediate. So we break that beta-1 glycosidic linkage, the links the dimer, disaccharide of the glucose and galactose and this allolactose uh, signified by this um, by this shape right here is then going to be broken down into galactose and glucose. So the cool thing actually about allolactose is that right here we have the repressor just normally repressing or bound, binding to the operator region. The allolactose acts as an inducer basically by binding the repressor protein and causing a conformational change that releases the repressor from the operator. So just in this base case scenario, when we have the RNA polymerase, it's unable to transcribe because the repressor acts as a roadblock. However, because the allolactose now binds the repressor, we see this. The repressor is, goes through a conformational change in its DNA binding region that would bind the operator, and it basically unbinds from it, allowing RNA polymerase to continue on and transcribe the LAC-Z, LAC-Y, and LAC-A structural genes. One interesting comparison is actually how um, E. coli use beta-galactosidase, like we see here, while humans actually use lactase to break down lactose. In humans, we have lactase breaks down the beta-1,4 glycosidic linkage to convert lactose into glucose and galactose. Um, in lactose intolerance people, lactase production is actually low or almost absent, allowing undigested lactose to actually go through this um, process here in the large intestine where E. coli take over and break it down. This causes uh, production of gas and bloating and discomfort overall. That's why lactose intolerant people basically just have an overall hard time digesting the lactose sugar in milk. And this is why bacteria thrive also in lactose intolerance cases because their lac operon is switched on. So going on over here, we see two very common themes in biology. 
a negative control and a positive control. So the repressor acts as a negative control, turning off the operon when lactose isn't around. In contrast, the cataboli activator protein, which I'm going to talk about in the next slide, acts as a positive control, boosting transcription in the absence of glucose. I like to think of it almost like an elemental boost to the RNA polymerase when it is present. So moving on, we see that the LAC operon is a prime example of polygenic mRNA, where a single mRNA is transcribed and encodes multiple proteins. This differs from alternate splicing seen in eukaryotes, where one gene can produce different mRNA variants. Understanding this difference is extremely crucial for mastering gene regulation concepts on the MCAT. I myself can attest to this. Now let's talk about glucose. So. Glucose is the main source of E. coli, main energy source for E. coli when it is present, and thus the lac operon usually remains off when glucose is available because there's no need to waste energy transcribing lactose metabolizing enzymes. However, under certain conditions where there is low glucose and if lactose is present, the lac operon can be turned on. This is cool because it essentially explains why we call it an inducible system, because it is normally turned off when there is normal levels of glucose. However, under certain conditions, like we said, low glucose and lactose being present, it can be turned on. So be, by being able to turn it, going from being turned off to turned on, we say that it is an inducible system. Now glucose going here, the um, glucose going here, we see when glucose is low, we actually activate this entire cascade of events. So when glucose is low, it activates adenyl cyclase, which converts ATP to CAMP. This increase uh, in CAMP activates the cataboline activated protein, which binds to the CAP site upstream of the promoter. The CAP-CAMP complex forms a dimer, as seen here, with the RNA polymerase, and significantly just boost that transcriptional efficiency. Think of it almost like an elemental boost, like I said before, for the RNA polymerase, hence the three positive signs. Now let's move on and talk about the four scenarios for the lac operon regulation. When we have low, gluco low glucose, like we stated before, we have high CAMP levels and thus high CAP. And that CAP then binds to that CAP site upstream of the upstream of the promoter. However, with high lactose, we also remember that some of it is converted into allolactose, which binds the repressor and causes that conformational change, and it's no longer able by able to bind the operator. So RNA polymerase is able to go on freely. So not only is RNA polymerase able to go on freely, it also has that elemental boost by that CAP, and thus we have very strong expression and high transcription of that lac operon. Second case scenario is that we have high glucose. When we have high glucose, we don't have as much ATP being converted to CAMP, and thus we don't see that CAP binding on that cap site. However, with high lactose, we still have the case where some of it is converted into allolactose, or a lot of it's converted into allolactose, and it causes that conformational change in the repressor, and it no longer binds the operator, and the RNA polymerase is able to transcribe the lac operon freely. However, this is a weak expression and only just one plus sign, as we see here, because we don't have that elemental boost from that CAP on the cap site. The third case scenario is if we have high glucose and low lactose. This is the ideal scenario for the E. coli cell. It just wants to have glucose, but and uh, if lactose is present, we're able to do these uh, up two scenarios. However, with high glucose, we don't need that CAP, and with low lactose, we don't have as much allolactose, so the repressor is still on the operator, and thus the RNA polymerase is blocked. It acts, the repressor acts as a roadblock, and the RNA polymerase is unable to transcribe the structural genes. Thus, we see here blocked and no transcription. For the fourth case scenario, we have both low glucose and low lactose. This is a pretty unideal situation for the E. coli bacteria. And thus, because we have low glucose, we would actually make the cataboli activated protein because ATP is converted to CAMP, and CAMP then activates uh, CAP, so that binds on the cap site. However, low lactose, we don't have as much allolactose, and thus the repressor is still strong and bound to that operator region, and the RNA polymerase is still, even though it has that elemental boost from the cap, it's unable to transcribe because the repressor it acts as a roadblock for the RNA polymerase to transcribe the structural genes. 
And thus we see in the fourth case scenario that it's also blocked and no transcription. In summary, when lactose is absent, the repressor still keeps on binding to the operator blocking transcription. Why? Remember, lactose is no longer being able to be converted to allolactose, which allolactose is supposed to bind to the repressor. So we see that in the second slide. When lactose is present, it's converted to allolactose, which inactivates the repressor and allows transcription. When glucose is low, CAMP levels rise because that adenosyclase enzyme is activated. Activating, so when CAMP levels rise, we activate the CAP protein, and this enhances transcriptional efficiency. And overall, just remember, there's always basal trans transcription that allows, that always ensures small amounts of enzymes are present to respond quickly when lactose appears. Thank you for watching. Make sure to like, subscribe, and leave a comment. I'll see you guys in the next video.